morning everyone and welcome to this latest uh, indica books uh, writers open house with otis and uh, you know the drill most of you are old hands familiar with the with the drill but for those of you and i do this every single time for those of you who may end up watching this out of sequence then this is an initiative from indica or indica academy as it used to be known and uh, uh, in, in, and done by and conducted by Indica Books. This is an initiative to help aspiring writers and authors to improve their craft of writing by having a, a professional uh, a person like Otis uh, to review your writing pieces and to give feedback on them, send you feedback. So you send them about 750, 800 words uh, and you send him at least a few days in advance. So he will review them, mark them up, send those pieces back to you. And then when we convene on Sunday evening, India time here, he'll go through those pieces and he'll only, uh, you know, uh, that is an opportunity for you to ask questions, not only about the piece, but about writing in general. This is open to all and everyone and uh, details are up on the Indica website and you can, uh, uh, and we also live stream this on our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash Indic Book Club. And we also put the recording of this uh, Q&A, this open house uh, on YouTube. So with that, Otis, I'll turn this over to you. And I believe you said that uh, you have uh, four pieces. So this should be a very interesting uh, session today. So over to you. Okay, uh, thanks. All right, um, nice to see you all. And thanks for sending pieces. Um, so I was, uh, sorry, I'm late. Um, I was just taking some notes about uh, some, some issues that I thought I would bring up. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused about what order I should go in because, um, hmm. Whether I should talk about these issues first or talk about the pieces first, I guess is what I'm debating. Um, let's. Um, who I'm not coming up with a good answer. Um, oh, sorry, I haven't. It's an ordering issue. Sequence of events is basically what we're dealing with all the time. And I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to sequence these events. Um, let's jump into the work. Okay, let's jump into uh, Ram's work here. I think this will set us off nicely. Ram, hello. How are you? Let me share my screen. Me. Okay, so I think Ram's work is, what happened? Um, you see the share here? So yeah, we can see it, right? Okay. Um, Ram, Ram gave himself the challenge, which is a which is a great one to try and write a story in one page. I've actually, I should take a look for this because I actually designed an assignment to um, try and encourage people to write a story in four pages, which where each page sort of. Uh, did the work of the first page did the, the work of the beginning, the second page did the well the second and third page did the work of the middle, but with a with a turning point between the the first the sorry the second and the third, and then the fourth page was a resolution page. So I have an assignment like that. I'll see if I can dig that up from somewhere, and maybe I'll send it to Abhinav and he can he can post it because it's a it is a it's a worthy thing to try to do, and. If we can understand a sort of stories for what it's worth are they're not really a new thing. <laughs> We've had stories for a long period of time and they have a kind of form. And then it's for us to work within that form, really. So uh, Ram, could you tell us a little bit about this work? Okay. Uh, yeah, so the way this started is on one of the uh, writing WhatsApp groups that I am, there was a daily prompt. And uh, the prompt in this case was a cup of coffee. 
because it was a prompt, this story was supposed to be like, you know, something like 200 words. So I thought that, okay, let me try writing that. And uh, then I uh, recalled uh, one of the sessions where you had said that uh, we need to uh, communicate as much as possible in as few words as possible. So then I said, okay, would it be possible to tell a story where we have protagonist, antagonist, conflict, setup, backstory, uh, indulges all the five senses, and uh, there is dialogue, there is action, and there is conflict, and there is resolution. So I said, I will try and do that. And uh, that's what I did here. Mm -hmm. um, in the, I mean, there are definitely people write what are called shorts and they write short, short stories. Um, there's even a, a phenomenon of writing the six, the six word story, wow. uh, okay. the most famous of which is Ernest Hemingway's story. Um, um, I think it's baby shoes for sale. Yeah. Never, never used, used. Just never worn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I mean, it can be interesting to look at all of those to see if they actually fulfill the bargain of story. Right. I mean, I think it does, and it's sort of that that uh, that piece probably fulfills the bargain of story in a metaphysical mm -hmm. way because the protagonist and the antagonist, the the protagonist and antagonist, are they on the page or is it between the reader and the and the text itself? It's hard to mm -hmm. say. Maybe they resonate together. Okay, um, so maybe you could just read a little bit of this, maybe the beginning of it, um, just down to the first page. Okay. Swati giggled as Deepak twined his finger, her fingers in his and whispered, the waiter has left into her ear. On the table in front of them, Swati's tumbler of hot coffee rolled his eyes. I thought at least today they'll be different, he said. Next to him, Deepak's glass of iced tea turned pink. The strawberry cordial on her head melted in the daily heat and trickled down her face. Stupid woman, coffee thought and shook his head, sprinkling a few drops of hot coffee on her. Iced tea jumped. Hey, watch it, she shouted. Coffee had had enough. Or else... He challenged, raising an eyebrow. Or else you will get this, Iced tea said, bobbing the straw to the surface, raising it like a sword. So says one who has a puddle around her feet. Coffee grabbed his belly and laughed so hard, he almost tipped over. Iced tea clattered her ice cubes. Hey, they both exclaimed together as a waiter crudely hefted them onto a tray. Coffee turned his head and saw a 500 rupee note tucked into the check jar. Swati and Deepak had left. His eyebrows drooped and he shook his head. Do you think they will put us in the freezer again and take us out when those two come visiting tomorrow? Ice tea asked, tears brimming over. Coffee nodded, a sad look in his eyes. He slid closer and hugged her, his metal clinking against her glass. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, so, you know, when I read this story, I recognized, obviously, you were doing the work of creating the, creating two forces and uh, putting them at odds with each other. It took me a little while to understand those two forces I, because I wasn't able to easily masculinize coffee and I wasn't that easily, you know, or feminize the iced tea. So it was like a, it was kind of a, a little bit dissonant for me. I didn't understand why one was masculine, one was feminine. I didn't understand their roles. They're being, I wasn't used it's, it's funny, you know, we, we do use cliches in a sense and stereotypes, you know, in our work. And so uh, if you've seen that there's a modern movie here in the US called Zootopia, and it sort of challenges some of these uh, traditional stereotypes where, you know, prey animals, you know, like in our cartoons, prey animals tend to be feminized, which is not true to nature. And predator animals tend to be masculinized. I mean, it's, you know, I have kids, so I, I, I've read a lot of kids stories and it can really annoy me uh, to have this sort of perpetual sort of association between feminine and masculine and, you know, predator and prey, for example, and then a whole bunch of other attributes. But here, you know, here I'm lacking all of that. So I actually have no bearing, which is okay. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's going to be the writer's responsibility to help me understand. Okay. You know, um, because 
we're always it's it's kind of funny i mean i i think about this i try not to think about it too much but it's like the the word is a bridge between us and the reader mm -hmm. and we have to work with either we have to work with either a common association mm -hmm. or we have to establish that common association we basically have okay. to teach the we have to teach the reader how to read and actually, you know, the, this really comes up so much in uh, in our work together, like my work with with Indic Academy, because you, as a group, have a you know have a base of knowledge that I don't share, right? So when you write things that I read, how do you help me be able to understand it in the same way that you understand it, right? And so I'm sort of talking about like the names, like mm -hmm. if I read the name of someone, I don't know who that is, but you do. So you have a totally different experience reading that name than I do. And you have to sort of take that into account. You have to train the reader essentially in how to read. So here it was, you know, sudden for me and that kept me out a little bit. Okay. But then, then I tried to, you know, sort of get over that and like, you know, uh, deal with it. And um, what I what I finally came to, and this sort of inspired my notes for this morning, among some other things, um, was that I really didn't identify, though you have antagonistic forces, mm -hmm. you don't actually have a protagonist. Right. So the protagonist is the one that I'm essentially identifying with finding a sense of um, sympathetic resonance is the way I put it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've played guitar, but I think of it sort of like a guitar. You, you get a tuning fork and you bang it, right? And it's not making any sound, right? You bang it, and then if, but if you put it on the guitar, the guitar will make an A sound, mm -hmm. right? That's how, yeah. you know, that's how you tune the yeah. guitar, you tune the A string. And that's how I think of the protagonist. There's the protagonist that doesn't make any sound, but when you touch it down onto my heart or whatever, not to be too corny, right? It it sounds, right? That's the okay. So there are the two things, you know. I, I I sort of talk about the beginning. If we're really talking about the sort of formalized story structure, the way I've reduced it in order to help myself and to try and save myself some time is to recognize that we really have two things that we have to do in the beginning, we have to establish the conflict. I don't think there's actually a rule between which way it happens. You know, some would say you want to start with in media race, which establishing the conflict in action is a little bit easier, maybe. And so then you do the next thing next. But basically, it's establish the conflict and establish uh, that sympathetic resonance, why we care. You, that's also basically establishing the external struggle and the internal struggle. And the internal struggle is the struggle of the protagonist. We don't really generally have time to explore the internal struggle of the antagonistic force. But that said, and I think this is really important, we should understand the internal struggle of the antagonistic force and understand that the internal that the antagonistic force has an internal struggle. Because otherwise, this just occurs to me, otherwise, we basically perceive of the antagonistic force as kind of a monster, right? It's not motivated. It's not a motivated um, thing. It's just a a sort of monstrous force that does things for no reason. The protagonist might think of the antagonistic force like that, which is fine. It's a bias, right? That is a bias, but the writer should not. That there needs to, there are absolutely, I'm sure that I've said this many times, there absolutely needs to be a division between the way the protagonist perceives the world and the way the writer 
perceives the world emotionally right. So the writer needs to be able to understand the, the internal struggle of the protagonist and basically all other characters in their, again, to the corny, in their heart, <laughs> in their gut, whatever you want to say, they have to basically understand that every character has an internal struggle, but they're really only representing and getting the reader to focus, focus and frame the internal struggle of the protagonist. That's where our emphasis lies. And here, basically, we don't really get into the interiority of these characters, so we don't know why this story matters. Right. One of the ways I think of it sometimes is that, and I mean, this isn't absolutely new to me, but I've been thinking it for a long time, is that essentially the protagonist needs their story, right? And one of the ways for us to think about the story as a whole is to be like, what is, why does this protagonist need to have this happen to them? It's not that it just happens. It's that it needs to happen. The movement of the story takes our protagonist on this journey that leaves them changed at the end. So that means that in the beginning, they need to be changed. We understand that as the writer, because we understand the beginning and the end the reader is focused only here. We focus the reader's attention on this point all the way through to the ending. They stay focused, but we understand as the writer from up here that there's this necessary movement. And so I'll go back, I'll just say that one more time. So in the story, the protagonist through their adversarial relationship with the antagonistic force which they need, it's not simply an adversary, it's also a teacher in a sense. So that the antagonist is a teacher, no matter how horrible the experiences might be, right? And often they're very horrible, right? The antagonist is a teacher that takes the protagonist to a state of change. And I will repeat, that means from our perspective, that here the protagonist needs to change. That is, uh, I'm not gonna be able to remember how John Barth describes this, but basically, well, I, he does describe it as this too, the, um, the unstable ground situation, unstable ground situation. That means we are starting with a problem and we are going to move to the solution. So if we think of that, Ram, in, in this piece, you know, we'll, we'll just say, you know, like if, if one of the characters is the coffee, what's the coffee's problem, right? Or the character could be the, the protagonist could be the iced tea. What's the iced tea's problem that needs to find a resolution yeah. in change? I've sometimes described, so I think I've probably said this, um, if a tree falls in a forest, it doesn't matter if it makes a sound, if it does not affect a character. Story is about a character being affected by what happens. That's actually, so that's the beginning argument. We're basically saying something happens here between the beginning of this and the ending of this, something will happen. We do not say nothing will happen. That is my, that's like my base. If the character walks in like this and they leave like this, stuff, stuff is occurring, right? I, I'm reading the words, you know, that stuff is occurring and they leave like this. My argument is nothing has happened. So that's, I mean, I, I think it's a great exercise that you're making for yourself. And you're, you're, you actually, I mean, in, in this, you're doing a lot to cover like how someone would be writing a dialogue because you definitely want a dialogue to be expressive of the character. And I think you do that in this. 
and you want to have that sense of antagonism. But the other thing that you need to have is you need to have that sense of movement, even in a scene, even in a scene of dialogue, you want to go from A to B. Yeah. Does, uh, does anyone else have any questions about that? Anyone want to jump in? We have a nice small group, and um, and um, you've all submitted pieces, so maybe we can have maybe more of a, a dialogue. So, uh, Otis, I have a question here. So let's take this format, for instance, that Ram has sent, right? The micro story. So basically a story that uh, is confined to, uh, to a page and it should follow all the, uh, or at least as many of the good uh, principles of story writing that you outline. Now, if a character has to change, how does that, uh, how, how, how would that look like? Because, you know, when you're talking about a longer novel, you have the luxury of uh, building up uh, to, to showing the need for change, the journey of the change, and then the change that happens that you can, that the reader can then look back uh, and contrast with the beginning of the novel where the character was something and now they have changed. And you can then see, you know, the need for, so how, I mean, is it, is, is it usually always the case that that, does happen even within these micro stories. I'm I'm basically making the argument that um, if we want to have a dynamic story on the page, that we need to do it. And I'm just I'm I'm coming to it from you know my long experience trying to create the best works that I'm going to create. I'm not saying by any means that we can't write something that's let's say four pages long, or three pages long, or one page long. Right? We can we can type. We're able to type. That's clear. I'm just saying that it's not a story unless something happens. And something happening means the character changes. That is, that is for me, the definition of something happened. Otherwise, nothing did happen, right? If it does not affect the character, then why, why am I saying that it's a, a, a moment of import? I don't write the story of me going to the bathroom. Because I, mm. you know, and, well, I mean, true, you, true. arguably I've changed. Arguably I've changed, but you know, um, it's it's not it's not it's it's not a profound experience. <laughs> We're picking our moments. I mean, this is this is what separates. We clearly don't, uh, except for that one Norwegian writer, I guess. We don't just write a chronicle of everything that occurs to us, you know. So we uh, we, we isolate I mean, them. Oh, and okay. I wanted to say, I, I, sorry, uh, please go ahead. Abhinav, you, you mentioned, you know, we have in a longer work, we have time to develop, you know, the, the, the need, you know, for something to happen or the need for change. And I want to say that actually, I, that's not the case. We as a writer, basically, and this is, I'll, I'll try and, you know, I'll get to my notes at the end. We basically begin with, this is what I mean by the unstable ground situation. The unstable ground situation is that the character, the protagonist enters the story. It's not, it's not that they enter the story with the need to have something happen to them. And basically one way to look at it is they're lucky enough as opposed to all of us living our normal lives, we will be lucky to have a story happen to us so that we do right. undergo some kind of change. But many people go through their entire lives. Well, I, I don't think that's really true, but at least unrecognized that things happen to them that can potentially change them. So there's no need to develop the, this backstory really for the character. They begin the story with that unstable ground situation. This is... Basically, we can think of it is they start the story with a problem that needs a resolution. And the antagonist is basically the, the you know, the messenger from God, you know, that, that provides the opportunity for this change to occur that's necessary for them to so continue I, I, on, on their stage. I yeah. see that Ram has raised his hand. So Ram, I'll ask my question, then I'll uh, uh, then you can ask yours, and Otis can uh, figure out, you know, in what order he wants to answer them. So my 
question is not strictly speaking it is not connected with this uh, particular discussion that we are having but uh, what i wanted to ask you otis is that uh, uh, fine so in a longer form uh, you know we have we have this uh, this you know unstable uh, dynamic uh, and, and ground reality and there's a need to fall change and and uh, those things right so we can develop the, that during the course of a novel now is it fair to say that if you take that novel that story uh, you know whatever 300 pages long and so on and if you break that down is it is it fair to say that even pieces of it when broken down in some ways need or should ideally conform to some sort of a, a, a journey that happens or that is being too simplistic? Uh, no, it's not. I, I mean, I, I like simplistic. It's complicated enough, right? We have to type all those letters, all those words. It's very, very complicated. So I don't think that that's too simple at all. It's basically, you know, a, 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 a movement an emotion, I, the, the curve is an emotional movement or a way to understand positive and negative or something like that. But um, basically we're talking about a, a journey of plot points that we're focusing on. The writer again knows the entirety. I know that one of, the, one of our difficulties in writing is that the writer knowing the entirety is simply not true as we're writing, right? But it is, it is the case after we have written so, right. so there's a little bit of a problem between us, you know, like my proposition that we know everything that happens when I'm actually, you know, I will always tell you to try and write towards discovery because we should use the story process. The story process is a kind of thesis where we draw things together and ideally we discover what's going to happen. And in that way, we use stories to advance and change ourselves first our own perceptions first, and then we basically present a story in some kind of way as an artifact of that action that we've already engaged in. I don't know. I, I think I went off the trail a little bit, but basically, Abhinav, yes, uh, it's a journey. Got it. I mean, Got it. Thanks. It, and we can understand that it must be because basically we're dealing with a linear form. Writing is a linear form. So it must be a journey, Got it. right? We read this word and then we read the last word. So we're going in this direction. It's already a steam train. And we either, and, and my strong suggestion is to use, we want to use our form. We want our subject and our form to basically correspond. So yeah, Ram. It's not a question. It's more of an observation. Uh, so which was more, uh, a response to Abhinav's question. So uh, most of us here would be aware of this very popular Hindi movie called Shakde, right? So it's a very popular movie. It is a very popular movie, about 10, 12 years so. Now the it was an extremely popular movie. And uh, if you notice in that movie, I don't know Abhinav if you have watched it. If you notice in that every single scene has a conflict. Every single scene has somebody that we as audience are rooting for. And every single scene, there is a resolution of that conflict. And in a lot of cases, the resolution leads to the next scene. But in every scene, there is a conflict right from beginning to end. And it weaves into the larger theme. But uh, I think we should all watch that. It's a brilliant case study in how to have conflict in every scene. So I think, yeah. So I, uh, Otis, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that, that's what made the movie very interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's it, it, it almost felt like uh, I uh, I've uh, read or heard in, in some place that you know the the template for uh, for a tele serial for instance that is about 22 25 minutes long is that it has to be broken up into three parts so that uh, the audience uh, gets engaged in the serial in the ep in, in the new episode immediately when it starts and then you build the story and it has to end at a point that leaves the viewer wanting to watch the next episode. I think that's somewhat, I think, similar to the template that this movie Chakte uh, seems to have followed, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, they, you know, the storytellers, particularly for movies and such, you know, they, they really do have all of this stuff wired and they have it wired because it works, basically, you know, that it, it works. 
and they have to do what works and not do what doesn't work because they're trying to separate people from their money. So the, the storyteller, this, right? Save the cat. I mean, they're, it's just, I mean, save the cat is like, I mean, it's as mercenary as you can be basically. I mean, it's just, it, I mean, that's a, that's a mercenary document. It's, uh, it's like, um, it's our version of Machiavelli's The Prince. You know, um, <laughs> so yeah, so we can learn a lot from movies. I think one of the great examples, uh, you know, for this idea of establishing conflict and then also showing that internal struggle is the, the American series, The Sopranos, right? Well, actually Breaking Bad is just as good. You know, any, any I mean, they're becoming... They are so good at writing these series now. It's just phenomenal. I mean, they're, you know, people call it the golden age of television. It's just so good. But in The Sopranos, for example, he comes out and he's in battle with other mob bosses or whatever and the police. And he's trying to, you know, that's all his external conflict. And then Tony Soprano goes to a therapist. If the people he knew knew that he went to a therapist, he would be understood to be vulnerable and weak. And people would prey upon it. So there you go. And we sympathize. We sympathize with that need to keep that secret. So they, they're extremely good at it. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at another piece. Um, thank, you, thank you for the feedback. This was really it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jay, Jay. Thanks for submitting something. Hi, Otis. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing great, I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, okay, tell us a little bit about this story. Where, 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 are, you, where are you going with it? Uh, okay, so there is this guy who is uh, trying to find his own footing in a different city. In a, in a line of work that proceeds from his education and is in line with the same business where his father has already built an empire, but he doesn't want to continue from that. Now, uh, his ambitions, his aspirations, they all come to a halt when he uh, is in receipt of a, a wedding invitation to somebody who he was formerly in love with. Ah, ha, ha. formally in love with. Yeah. Formally in love with is not a problem. Is it? But from his perspective, he continues to be in love with her, but from her perspective, she's broken off. <laughs> right, okay, now, we, now, <laughs> we're, now we're a little bit closer. Okay, good. All right, um, let's, uh, let's have you read a little bit of this beginning, uh, just maybe just to there. Okay. Uh, Rajan scrolled through his Twitter feed as he waited for the elevator. The beep announcing the arrival of the elevator was drowned by the ringtone of his phone. Amma calling. He rejected the call. The patchy signal in the elevator as he went up 36 floors would only worsen the misunderstanding between the two of them. See, you do not have time to even answer my call. This is why I wanted you in Chennai. Why couldn't you just take care of our factory here? He read her message pop up from the notification screen without entering WhatsApp. The elevator was, be was between moving from floor eight to nine. The call and the reiterated explanation will have to wait. But explain what? There is nothing new to tell her. His reflection in the elevator mirror stared back at him, equally clueless. The overhead light reflected off his shaven head and highlighted the grease marks on his blue overalls. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, when I so when I first read this story, and actually it was a lot clearer to me now. But so there's some things that we I was having this conversation with Ram, like about how you have to help the reader. So don't expect the reader to know anything. The reader knows nothing. I I I really, and they actually not only do they know nothing. They don't want to do any work to find anything out. They don't want to do any work that's more than reading words. They like reading words. That's very calming for us. 
but they don't want to struggle intellectually. So I don't know if Ama suggests that this is the mom. Is that, does that suggest that it's the mom? Jay? Hello. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, so it didn't to me, I'm going to tell you. So I don't know okay. who Ama is. So, but this time, because I've read the whole piece and I understand the character of the mom, I can totally hear the character of the mom now. But you have okay. to help us. You have to say, ringtone, it was his mother, Ama. You know, so you got to give us, a, you got to give us a little bit of help there so that we can conceptualize and understand it. This is, I mean, it's the point I was making with Ram and I've made it before, like names, names are essentially meaningless, but the relationships between people, that's the important thing to establish. Okay. Yeah. So, and now, now that I understand the relationship between these two characters, I also understand much more what the character is doing. I actually am taking to this piece much more than I did in my first reading because I understand what the character is doing. He's escaping. And actually, the, the thing that I was going to say in total about this story is that this invitation to the wedding seems to be the beginning of the story. But actually, now that I understand that Amma is the mother, I understand the principal conflict between, being between this, this you know, young man and the mother, right? And that's a that is actually a problem that's consistent in some of the backstory that occurs too. And you actually are doing a pretty good job. Now that I have to recon reconfigure my entire understanding of this story and just encourage you to make it clearer what's happening here is that basically the mother, like a little bit like a helicopter mom, is on this guy you know, who's trying to make his own life. And he's actually engaged in an action here, which is avoiding the mother. So avoidance is an action. There are two basic actions that, that human beings have, just like every animal on earth, fight or flight, right? We always will choose flight first, basically, if we can get away and fight only when we have to right? Because we're trapped. So he's clearly in a flight mode. He's trying to escape, but it is an action. But I did not understand it as such because I couldn't understand what was going on. Um, the, I think that that's actually pretty good. So there, you know, my, my comments were going to be, Jay, you have a character getting on an elevator. So that's not much happening. I don't understand what the conflict is, but that's because I didn't understand what the conflict is. So now what we have to understand, what, you, what we wanna do is we want to show the character action. So the reader has to understand that he's trying to avoid talking to his mother. We have to understand that his action to get on the elevator is an action to avoid. Right. And so it is part of the conflict. Does that make sense? Like once we once we kind of draw out what the conflict is, then we want to make sure that we emphasize it and make it clear on the page. Not that we have to say. Um, uh, we don't end up just stating it, but we show the characters and what they're doing. The mom is, you know, pinging and, you know, trying to communicate and he's purposely trying to avoid that communication. Does that make sense? The, actually, the action, the action in the beginning of the story now makes sense to me now that I understand who the characters are and what's happening. OK, yeah. So like you said, do not try to make the reader do your job. Uh, that's one. That, uh, thank you. That's a very succinct way to put it. OK, I, I think you have a future in this. OK, <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> then we have. Um, Attention wandered to conversation. Okay, <laughs> attention wandered to a conversation from three years ago. Jay, I think we should know at this point what I'm going to say about this. Hmm. What do you think? Okay, so we are trying to pull the reader from a POV where he has already settled in and put him into something else. 
Yeah, no, that's that's probably not going to be that good. And the only way, basically, what I I look at all backstory, all backstory, all exposition is done for only one purpose, one purpose, and that is to stall the momentum of the story in order to heighten the tension for the next action. It is for no other reason. So we don't explain things to people. We don't. Uh, you know, it's basically you're using a backstory. This backstory is being used for exposition purposes. It's being being used to explain. Let's never explain anything. I'm I'm begging everyone. We don't have to explain everything because everything is obvious, right? What's obvious is it would be obvious if we put it on the page that there's antagonism. That is the story. The conflict is the story. It should be obvious. Let's make it obvious. And the actions of character are a result of that conflict. So yeah, we go into backstory. It's being used as exposition, but there's no real forward action here. So I'm not wondering what the character is going to do next. In fact, what the character does next is get off the elevator. So it, that doesn't work. I, right? So yeah, so we don't want to do that. We'll just, but, but, but what I do Okay, when I'm writing is, and because of the nature of the way we think as writers, writers, you know, we're, we're up here above and we can write from any time that we want to, right? Uh, Jay, can you mute your, mute your, okay, thank you. Um, as writers, right, we are not constrained by time and space or any of those things. And when we're writing our first draft, we very often are just developing our ideas. So we're just typing along. So we're typing in the elevator. We're like, okay, I'm going to start here. I don't know why. And then we go, oh, well, let's have this backstory. Okay, I don't know why. So I'm going, I'm going to this present time, which I'm establishing with the reader. They're reading along and they're like, this is the story that I need to be interested in. But then suddenly the writer goes to a backstory. But it's completely natural for us as writers to do that. Or we might jump ahead or we go all over the place because of the nature of sitting there and typing. Because when we sit and we type, we're, we're like, OK, I'm thinking. But the representation of life is chronological and exists in location and time. So they're different. The way we can think and the way we live are different, basically. So it's very often that we write something that's a jumble, particularly in regard to time and then. What, what I'm really going to suggest is that we unravel it or figure out how to repurpose what we've done. So I want to just repeat that, repurpose it. So rather than have it as backstory, we instead, we have this kid, um, he's, uh, he's in an elevator, he's going home, he's ignoring this, and then he gets the letter. Fine. Somewhere down the line, we, you know, his mom you know, comes to this city. She says she's there for a shopping trip and she shows up with the father at the apartment. And now they have this conversation. Does that make sense? So I'm basically repurposing this conversation that supposedly took place in the background and using it for explanation. I'm taking it out and I'm putting it into the front story. I'm using the same information. Does that make sense? We tend, and Abhinav, I know, will, you know, he'll want to chime in on this. You know, we argue against, you know, this tyrannical nature, you know, my, my tyranny by saying, can't we have backstory? Why can't we have backstory? Yes, leaving it as backstory is easy. It means we don't have to rewrite it. But we can make it better if we do rewrite it. We can make the experience for the reader better because we're going to have something that's chronological. That's not going to be us trying to explain stuff like we're... The problem with exposition, when we start to um, explain to the reader things, it's as if we're telling the reader stuff that we feel they have to know. That is a relationship of authority over uh, a reader who is a subordinate. 
the reader so, doesn't like the wait let me just finish this the reader does not like that relationship you know like this idea of mansplaining okay mansplaining nobody likes it because it's paternalistic we do not want to have a paternalistic relationship with our reader we want to have a relationship of perceived absolute equality in fact we want to have so much equality that they they don't even have a sense that we exist they feel as if they're simply reading life itself on their own and experiencing life on their own without the author coming in and saying hey by the way you really need to understand this yeah abana so exposition seems to be more a case of telling and not showing that uh, you need to know this to understand this situation and i am telling you this so that you can understand why a character is behaving the way they are right if you that's the problem with telling so the problem mm -hmm. with telling from my point of view the problem with telling is that what, as soon as we start to tell we develop this relationship i am telling you i am telling you we do not want to have that relationship we want to make it like this when we show then the reader feels as if they're experiencing life as it's unfolding they don't feel any authority there that that is basically holding themselves above the relationship of the author and the reader is one of absolute equality but i want to repeat the only reason from my point of view to have something that is exposition or tells is because it helps the reader understand what it is happening they understand the stakes of it so my example is <clears throat> i've i've gone through this so many times i sometimes worry that i'll, I'll get it right okay so this is my story um i was uh riding with my friends billy mac and bobby uh by the old mcgillicutty house and bobby says to me he says i dare you to go up there and knock on the door and i said i'll knock on the door and he says no, i dare you you're not doing it why are you not doing it you're scared and i'm like i'm not scared i'll do it any time i'll do it any day and he says you're scared i can see you yell you're shaking i'm like i'm not shaking i'm fine i'll go right up there right now and it's like okay go ahead and do it so i get off my bike and i walk up the steps to the old mcgillicuddy house and i raise back my fist the old mcgillicuddy house is the house where seven people were murdered just last summer right that's exposition right i just put exposition in there but why did i put it in there i put it in there for i put it in there for two reasons i just raised back my fist right i'm putting that in there to pause the action i'm not putting it in there to explain something the story could go on without it right it's a parenthetical statement i could tell the story without it but i put it in there to stop the action to raise the anticipation for the next action does that make sense i'm using it to create the rhythm of the story i'm not using it to explain something to the reader right. it's a big big difference and so in my story i raised back my fist the mcgillicuddy house was the place where five murders took place just last summer as i brought it down to smash that door it opened in front of me i'd show bobby that who was afraid and who wasn't it opened in front of me i turned and ran that's how my story works yeah so so i know that i know that you've all read this backstory and you know the the, the problem is that we 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 live in a world <laughs> sorry, you know it's probably, you know we're in trouble when i say we live in a world okay but we live in a world in which we're subjugated by so much education where people are telling us stuff okay personally i have a problem with it i don't like it and i don't like teaching this like that but we're so used to all this you know someone's up here explaining stuff to us teachers are explaining stuff to us and then we feel like we feel like well we're reading that too right someone's just explaining stuff to us no the best works are not being explained to you the best works are stories that are unfolding in front of your eyes in which the writer is modulating the pace 
and the rhythm of the story, like a like an Aikido artist. You know Aikido? They, you know, you you try and grab them, right? You know, they're they open up, the reader opens up the book like this, grabs it, and the Aikido artist goes like this. And then he takes them like this. And then maybe he takes them like this and this again. And then he flips them over on his back. So as writers, we're an Aikido artist. That's what we're doing. We take them this way, we take them this way, we throw them over on their back. Jay, just do that. I, I know we want to explain so much. We want to, my God, because you know why? I do think this. I mean, I think about this psychologically. It's safer for us. It's safe to be in a position where we explain things, where we know and they don't know. And we tell and they get told to. That is not the relationship. We have to have a very unsafe relationship with our reader, which is one of absolute equality. You know what? They might not like our story and they might put it down anyway. We might not have, we might not have done it well enough. That will happen. We will be rejected. That will happen. We can't force people to like it. It's a chance we got to take. Um, but anyway, the, the answer is then, and I'm looking at you, Abhinav. <laughs> no, <laughs> the answer is not to argue as to why you need the backstory, but to think to yourself, how can I use this? I've written it. It is, there's something here I want to do, but how can I make it work with this relationship of equality that I want to have with my reader? And it's very simple. Take that backstory element. You have this dialogue either have that one or something like it, right? Because you can change the words. It's just showing a dynamic is what, it, what you're doing. Take those and recast it in the present story. Yeah, as you were saying this, uh, describing all this, what is a thought struck me that imagine that, that if the book were a movie, you wouldn't have a voice come in in the background as uh, the person you know raises his fist to knock on the door that uh, this is the door or uh, you know that leads to the house where five murders were committed last summer right you wouldn't have that if it were included this piece of information it might be in the in in the somewhere in the dialogue between the two people as you know the what the first person is daring the second person i know you're a chicken just because you know five just because five people were killed you're a chicken exactly same way yeah that's that's a good way of thinking about it if it wouldn't if it if it would feel jarring in a movie uh, you know the the viewer wouldn't want to be told like you know the viewer wouldn't want to be told when watching a movie look at this guy he's tall he's more than six feet tall so he's strong you you never have a movie where something like this happens right you don't need to you don't need to because it's already there or in the in the movie it would go like this right you would you know You'd see it running up and then we go and then you suddenly go and then you'd see my eyes. And then I, right. And then as I'm going like this. And then you'd go back into a distant shot. I would turn around and I'd run like hell. And so would everybody else, including that jerk Bobby. No, got it. That's that's very useful. I think I think that's one uh, sort of a way formula to think about the, some of this. So that is it exposition versus is this a, uh, is it exposition? Is it backstory or is it it can be done some can it be done some other way? Uh, I have a point. Uh, actually, a question. So, if you look yeah. at American Beauty, I mean that's a classical film which is taught. We start with a flash forward where he says. I'm Lester Bug and I will be dead in one year. So, uh, you know, uh, why use that device? Why? I mean, it's a, it's an, it's actually, I mean, it's a, that's an envelope. And so that is a structure that people use. I mean, basically, you know, I think an envelope shows a little lack of confidence, you know, myself. They're basically saying that I'm going to have a story of import, right? Um, it, that was American Beauty, 
did you say? Yeah, American Beauty. Devin okay, so so they're probably reasoning is like, you know what? We don't want this to seem like it's just a story about a guy who's essentially a pedophile. You know, we want it to be about something a little bit greater. So oh, we no. better we, we better assure the audience rather than just go down. It's like, do, 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 do. ooh, she's a hottie. I'm going to go work at a pizza joint, you know? Right. So instead of that, where the reader might be like, what am I getting involved in? They have a sense of, um, you know, I'm going to be dead. And then also embedded in that is actually a clever little dissonance, right? How can someone narrate to you that they're going to be dead? Right. Right. So we're talking about, so we're raising the level of the story and the consideration into what then ends up being a spiritual journey. And we actually, as it is, it's a quest, right? It's a quest for eternal life in a sense. Um, it's uh, Lancelot and the Green Knight and, you know, all the other Gilgamesh and all the other quests for eternal life. And so we're actually dealing with something on a spiritual dimension. And, and that way the, the audience, you know, feels okay about watching it, um, <laughs> basically, because otherwise they would, they would judge themselves. Right. Huh. How about that as an explanation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it works. Yeah, it is clever. It's, it's clever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Jay, did you raise your hand? No, I had to lower it. There wasn't anything as such. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's... Um, uh, Madhavi, let's talk about your piece. Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, good, a little anxious. Anxious? Why do you feel anxious? Uh, because when you reverted the write up, it was not as blue as it generally is. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. It's fine. We gotta, we gotta keep typing. The main thing is that we keep typing. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell us, tape, tell us a little bit about the from typing. I, you know, <laughs> I actually, I, Zandi got irritated at me. I was like, I think I was like, um, you know, I want to make a dedication, you know, on a book to the person who taught me to type, because really that's the thing that's been the key to my entire, you know, writing career is the fact that I know how to touch type. Everything else, everything else just happens. The typing is the hard part. Um, tell us a little bit about this story. Okay, so... Um... This character, uh, Queen Kaikai, is from Ramayana, the other epic. Uh, the general perception about Kaikai is that she was this evil stepmother who sent Ram to exile for 14 years. So I'm trying to see the story, look at the story from her point of view. Like what exactly happened? Was she that evil? Because up to that point, when she banishes Ram, she has been a very loving mother to him. Uh, but there comes a point when uh, her husband tells her that uh, he is going to hand over the reins of the kingdom to Ram and she's very happy. But then overnight something happens and then she banishes him the very next day when he was about to be crowned. So that's about it. So trying to yeah. see through her perspective and uh, she has some bones. She was offered a few promises and uh, there were some curses running with her. So all, the, all of them come together and uh, this happens. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a very uh, different take from the general perception. So I'm not very sure how people are going to receive this, this line of thought. Good, well, I, I, think it's, I think it's really great. And I read this mainly, you know, it's obviously it's, it's very interior and you probably know that I'm gonna say, you know, I'm gonna do, you know, Ram can even do do it at this point. You know, I mean, as you know, when when we have a character who's thinking, then this is what it appears like on the page, right? So they're not doing anything. So yeah. that's that's problematic. But I also think that it's it's important and good if you're if you're going to spend time developing a character that you try and get into their point of view and understand them. I actually it, tried taking this paragraph out of the equation. But then I felt the write-up was a bit incomplete. So I had to, you know, uh, 
uh, keep it back. Well, th this is something that I've heard and I, Madhavi that oh. I don't know that it's certain, but there's when, when people write scripts, right? Mm -hmm. They, as you know, Abhinav is already, you know, suggesting we don't have character. We don't have the narrator usually coming in and telling us a whole bunch of stuff. We don't usually have a lot of that voiceover. We had in Goodfellas, we have some of it. Uh, you know, I, I, I tend to think generally it's a weakness, but I've heard this, that there's basically two ways to write scripts. One, you start writing it, you know, and you write scene by scene and you write the dialogues. And what you're going to find at the end of that is that you don't really know you have maybe four or five characters in your movie and you don't know any of those characters. You're just writing dialogue. And the dialogue is basically the words that they're saying are empty because you don't know the character who's saying them. This is right. Uh, I mean, this is a, uh, I mean, it's a, maybe it's a nuance of perception, who knows, but you actually just have people using words as opposed to people trying to get what they want people who are motivated to, to uh, be known or what, what have you. So one way is people write that script and they just type out all the things and what they have to do is then they have to rewrite it and they have to think and they have to rewrite it. And they end up doing, let's say 20 revisions on their script. The other way some people write movie scripts is they sit down and they do all this work ahead of time. They do not write the script. They understand the characters that they have they write the characters' backstories, right? They write the characters, I mean, often the backstory, because for writers, generally, we think of the way people are as being a result of their experiences. We don't, and we think of what they do. This is probably important for this character here as being a uh, basically a kind of a result of what they've learned and their backstory and their experiences and then choices that they make that they feel are the correct choices, right? They, it can sometimes be very difficult choices, but they make choices that are essentially correct. We do not think of characters as being evil characters or good characters because that's static. And it's not, and, it, and the problem with, with representing characters like that is that the reader can't identify with them because the reader doesn't think of themselves as evil. And we don't, even though we generally do think of ourselves as good, we understand ourselves as being a little bit more complex interiorly. We might like to, like to present ourselves as just good, but we usually understand ourselves a little bit more complexly. So we actually don't identify with either good characters you know, or evil characters. So anyway, the movie writer, they'll write the backstory, they'll, you know, maybe scenes, maybe formulative moments, you know, these various things about their characters. And they might write hundreds of pages about the characters. And then they put that aside and then write their story. Then they write the script. And so I'm saying all that to say that I feel like maybe that's a little bit what you're doing here. You're, you're searching and writing this in order to discover this character. And then I, I would definitely suggest when, we get, when it gets time to writing the story that you finally want to write a story that engages in a location with characters in action. Does that, does that make a little sense? But I think, it's, okay. I think it's really good work trying to understand this character and to try and reconceive her. I mean, this is obviously something we're talking a lot about in these workshops, basically wrestle her out of a place where she's sort of been pegged as a static yeah. character. She's evil, you know, she's done something wrong and try and take her out of that and understand her in more human terms. And I think those human terms is that she's neither good nor evil. She's a person, a human being, who's making choices that she thinks are the right choices for some reason that she understands. So let's try to understand what those reasons are. Oh, well, let's have you read a little bit of it. Sorry, we skipped that. Can you, can you read this part? Sure. How I wish I wouldn't have to endure such pain. Who on earth would have thought the brave warrior queen, the most favorite of his majesty's wives, would end up like this, shunned by her own kith and kin? 
Not that they are at any fault, though. I made them go through such atrocities. They're bound to hate me with all their might. And they will make sure that the whole mankind hates me till eternity. I have successfully brought upon myself the wrath of history. The future generations will hate me with a vengeance for what I managed to accomplish. Single-handed, I brought down a kingdom on its knees. I deprived the people of their king and their crown prince. I destroyed my own family. I brought upon a destruction that was unheard of, and in return, I will now have to endure a backlash that will surpass ages and probably many a lifetime. Nobody, not a single soul would ever know why I did what I did. They will never understand that it was all predestined, and I, that unfortunate Queen Kai Kai, was a mere facilitator in the turn of events. I was the one chosen to bring about a string of prophecies to their fruition. Uh, great. I, I really like <clears throat> how you're basically adopting this point of view. So I think that that's one of the great things that we do as a writer. We try to essentially write from a point of view other than our own. It's a remarkable imaginative feat. Um, so I think that that's really great. Um, when you're reading this, uh, <clears throat> There are some things that occur to me. So one, when we're trying to understand characters, we should, I, it seems to me that we should understand that characters do not know themselves why they're doing things. Okay. Uh, as I think it's Oscar Wilde said, only the shallow know themselves. <laughs> I love Oscar Wilde. Um, Oscar Wilde also said his last words were, either these drapes or I have to go. So anyway, characters don't know themselves. Only the shallow know themselves and we do not write shallow characters. Our characters don't know themselves. So that does inform me when I think about characters and how I represent them. We want to think about, however, we as writers up here, we want to understand our characters. We want to understand what motivates them. The way I think about characters now is that basically fairly early on, we come up with a, we, we take a chance basically with a survival strategy. Fight, maybe, flight, maybe, maybe something else, right? We take a, we take a stab at it. When we're young, we, we feel like it's necessary for us to act you know, in our own self-preservation, we flee or we fight or we do something in order to preserve ourselves. And you know what? We're successful. That confirms for us, and, and some psychologists call this confirmation bias, because we're successful, we think it's the right thing to do. We basically then go from that moment on doing the same thing over and over again which continues to entrench us in a kind of confirmation bias. We, we continue to be successful in our survival strategy because we haven't been completely annihilated. And we think that our path is a correct one. And we think that everyone else's path is an incorrect one. Go figure, human beings. So that's another way that I sometimes use to try and understand characters, which also means that we can kind of trace back and begin to understand their actions based on what they're doing. And we can kind of have a sympathy for characters by seeing that somewhere early on, they've had, a, they've had an initial choice in which they started down this path. So that's another thing that I bring to trying to understand characters. The other thing that I bring to trying to understand characters is this, do you know? Uh, do you know the boxer Mike Tyson, American boxer? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Okay. Well, he had a coach named Customato, and Customato said, "Wherever you end up, you wanted to go all along." That's a profound little statement, I gotta say. Um, wherever you end up, you wanted to go all along. And I, and I was thinking of that when you were reading this ending. There's, because what you're, I mean, in terms of me, if I'm trying to understand this character and using that quote as a, as a way to sort of try and understand his character, 
I see in her choice of action, the outcome is sort of a, is punishing, right? She punished, like she, I do believe characters make choices. They make choices that are either willful choices. They're, well, they're all willful choices in a sense because we're doing them. So they're willful choices, whether they're understood subconsciously or consciously, that's who knows. But we're making a choice. Since we don't understand ourselves, it's not completely conscious. And we're not completely willful. We're also compelled to do it based on our experiences. So, um, but the outcome does, I think, tell us on some level what it is we wanted. So those are maybe a couple of things to, to bring to understanding this character so that you, I think you do a great job of getting into her point of view, which I think is really great. So that is one level of understanding the character, how she sees her own actions in herself. That's great. Now add to it your level of being able to understand this character as the writer. Does that make sense? Uh, the writer understands that characters are motivated that they basically act in accordance to their experience and habit, right? Because we are, we are creatures of habit. And I like to add this idea that the outcome can inform us about the intention. So I think it's a really, really great start. Uh, any questions? Not at this point. Yeah. So yeah. This, this is great, great writing. Keep doing it. And also, I think you had to experience a little bit. Um, this is something I've said to Ram before. Like when it comes to stories, you know, voice, voice doesn't hold up that much. But voice is very, in, because voice is just voice. We actually really want concrete things to be happening and we want dr drama. You know, going back to the play, we want the characters on there and we want them, we want a rifle, you know, ah, there, there you go. It's a little bit like Chekhov's rifle if we think about American beauty, right? At the end of this, I'm going to be dead. That's like opening up the scene and seeing the rifle. So same kind of thing, uh, which is a little bit like that envelope that we were talking about. Um, I lost track of where I was going. I got sidetracked into American beauty and now... <laughs> now I'm lost with Javi, but but this is oh I guess I was saying that voices voices uh is is weak in the story itself, but it's a great it's intoxicating, and it's a great way for us to begin to understand and hear the character that we're treating. So I think that's really you know it's really good work. Thank you. I round that out. Okay, let's look at uh, DT. Um, which one is this one? Okay. DT, how are you? Good, how are you? Um, I'm doing well. You wanna get us up to speed a little bit with this, uh, with this piece? Sure, so this is a continuation of, uh, of what will hopefully one day be a novel about uh, about Indra, the the king of gods, and he's kind of in this place where he feels um, a bit obsolete, and like the world is evolving past him, and he wants to, uh, or he's contemplating retirement, um, and so uh, that that's, that was kind of the the setup. And then last week we were talking about not having too many scenes versus just dialogue and, and talking heads. So I was trying to think of some some action and basically what starts happening now is there's a a call to battle and he's preparing himself for 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 for, for battles so that's kind of the the backdrop for the scene okay great and uh, um yeah i would i would say one thing is i feel like you did a really nice job too with um sort of putting the words on the page that evoke this location and this experience so i feel like i'm much more present in this place whatever it is you know, I feel like you did that work too, you know, and concentrated on that. Yeah, that was also from from last week. So trying to imagine it and, and the setting and yeah. Okay. Um, can you read a little bit to get us started? 
Sure. Uh, let's see. Um, so until where? Oh, okay, that part. Got it. Shachi rose in a flurry of diaphanous pink silk and gauze arranging her hair back into a coiffure pinned with diamond and ruby encrusted golden combs. Other babies she knew liked to put flowers in their hair. She preferred gems that would never fade or wilt. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh. You, oh, oh, I meant you. Oh, sorry. I meant you to start up. At the time. Oh, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm sort of like, uh, <laughs> this is not. Okay. Let's start at the top. Okay. Right. Take it from the top. All right. Indra was in his wife's quarters when the beating of the kettle drums boomed through the celestial skies announcing war. The skies in the heavens were different from the skies of the mortal cosmos. They were self-illuminated, progressing from pink to purple to black to yellow based on the mercurial moods of Surya Deva who governed the suns of all the worlds. Indra leapt to his feet, scattering the golden hued satin cushions from the couch where he was reclining with his wife Shachi. Is that what I think it is? Am I really being summoned to war? It has been so long since I've heard the sound. Indra clapped his hands, summoning guards and servants to dress him in his golden armor and prepare his mounts for battle. He decided today he would take both Airavata, his beloved elephant, and Ucheshavas, his seven-headed flying horse. It was a special occasion, after all, to be riding off to battle after such a long time. Shachi rose in a flurry of diaphanous pink silk and gauze, arranging her hair back into a coiffure, pinned with diamond and ruby encrusted golden combs. Other ladies she knew liked to put flowers in their hair. She preferred gems that would never fade or wilt. Great. Husband, must you go? Oh, sorry. Husband, must you go? Are you sure it is you they are calling? <laughs> I love that line. So that like, it nicely characterizes her. Okay. There's, um, it, you know, as you're reading this, um, I'm, I'm thinking there, there, there's two major things. So one has to do with the writing. I think we'll talk about that in a minute. And then this other one is really, uh, strangely, it, it, it comes nicely out of the conversation with Madhavi. So Indra's a character like in your style, Aditi, and this is, I think, a little bit true of your style, you just start going, you start typing. So remember like the two forms of script writing, the, there's the, the person who just starts writing the script, and then there's a, the person who writes like 200 pages of the backstories of all of their characters and understands them and da da da. And then in the last, you know, three months, they write the entire script. So they do all that pre-work ahead of time. You're a little bit more of this school, you know, where you just start, you just start going because you enjoy the typing and the imaginative experience. And I'm with you. I, I pretty much do it that way too. What it means is I do have this feeling of like not knowing who Indra is. I don't know what's motivating Indra. I don't know them really as a character. And I think, you know, things can work together. I mean, you're maybe, you know, Indra is the, the supreme god how how is indra you know possible to be knowable and all of that and that works perhaps a little bit conveniently with the style of writing that you like to do right you know you just want to get the character on the page and you want things to start happening and uh so i guess i put that forward as something to maybe think about you know at the at the I'm gonna say at the, at the end of the day, we have to have a character on the page. And this maybe even loops around the stuff we were talking about at the very beginning. It can't just be a name. Indra has to be a person that I actually identify with. That I basically, that I understand we want to get the external conflict onto the page. So we want that to happen. But then we also want to understand what the internal conflict is. And I don't think I have a sense of the internal conflict for Indra. And that internal conflict has to be one that I, as you know, just a mortal human being, can actually understand. So now you have a little bit of a dissonance. If you're trying to write a god and a supreme being, you also have to make them basically personified as a, a person with sort of mortal issues. Um, so... I do feel that kind of absence. It becomes a little bit like, you know, as I was saying, like those who do not do the work in the script writing, 
they can write all the dialogue. And the dialogue might even be uh, edgy and all of that, but it can feel empty because the character is not saying it. It's just the words that are being said. And I feel that way a little bit with Indra right now. Uh, it's, it's interesting. So that's something, I'm, I'm gonna have some notes that I'm gonna go over that I think are, are um, applicable to a lot of the works this week. The other, this is maybe a, like a little bit of a step down, but one of the, this is probably what I end up doing in terms of discovering characters. It does mean a lot of rewriting. This is the problem. This is the problem with discovering characters, but whatever, there's writing one way or another. You know, sometimes I do it with thinking and I don't actually write the stuff out. And it has been, you know, at times that I've really isolated my characters, thought about what they're like, kind of pegged them a little bit as playing certain roles. And then, I mean, there was a short story that I wrote that was pretty complicated and, and in the end, pretty good that I ended up thinking about for a couple of years, just on the back burner. And then I wrote it in, you know, two weeks or something like that. So the writing is going to happen somewhere. It really just depends what, what you want to do. Um, but one of the ways I have learned about my characters is I make them the actors of the work. I basically get into their point of view and I discover them by being in their point of view. And so this is sort of just a writing, a writing level thing. If you see here, we have Indra. We'll look at these verbs. Ooh, let's, if we can, I wish I could have another color. Let's see if I can. Let's have green. Okay, Indra was. Okay, skies in heaven were. Uh, they were. Right? So we could say that those are weak verbs. They're really just states of being, right? That's what those, that's what those words end up being. They're just states of being. And that sort of corresponds to this ethereal sense that I think you have when you're imagining this place that you just imagine it as a state, but it doesn't really have a kind of materialism. And you see the problem when you get to even like, Indra walked into his wife's quarters. He looked at the far wall and towards the window and out into the celestial heavens, you know, whatever it is that he's seeing, right? Once you make it, Indra is acting. The protagonist, and this does seem it's going to be Indra's story, we might as well isolate and focus on his point of view. And then we want to reveal the world through that point of view, right? He walked over, right? And then, so now we start to actually really materialize the space that he's in. He looked out her window, um, you know, you have some kind of measurement, some kind of like old timey measurement, hectator, hectators or whatever. I don't even know what to call them, you know, and looked out over the celestial heavens, you know, Saturn, you know, by, you know, whatever you want to put out there. And then uh, he walked over to, um, to his wife's Queen Anne's desk. She loved Queen Anne's, you know, or something like that. He put, <laughs> that she just got yesterday or whatever, you know, he leaned against it and he says, do you hear that, honey? Right? She, then, so, so, that would be the start of it. You know, once you get that character acting, Indra acting, and then seeing this world through his point of view, and, and I would probably suggest limiting yourself to his point of view for the reason that I often say, because once you get the reader involved in a point of view, that's a location for the reader's consciousness. To take them out and throw them into another point of view is dislocating, obviously, we go from one location to another location and dislocation is unsettling for us. So we do that at our peril. If we're going to have multiple points of view and I'm not sure that you will, I, I would definitely do them in chunks, almost even chapters or something like that. But I don't know if you're going in that direction. It seems like you're, you're you know, sticking with Indra. Um, 
Yeah, and I, and I wasn't I sure knew. if in the I was, just, I was I wasn't sure if in the third person there was some latitude for like a a paragraph to to kind of go into someone else's point of view, even though they're not going to be a point of view character, and and that happens a few times here. But I I think what you're saying is it's best to just stay in that in that point of view and, and not have that that dislocation. Right. I mean. Uh, this is the way I think of it. You know, people often think like third person and first person. They think that there's some huge difference. I actually don't think there's really a difference between the two of them. Oh. We do the same thing in either case. If you're writing Indra, you're either writing in his point of view or you're writing outside his point of view as a narrator. Those are two distinct voices. If you're writing in first person, you're either writing in that first person's point of view or you're writing first person narrator. They're actually two distinct voices in either case. Mm -hmm. The problem with writing a narrator is why are you writing that narrator? That's like the voiceover in the movie. It's the same thing. Is it, do you need it or do you not need it? That's a big question. You know, do we need that narrator to come and tell us that the McGillicuddy house is really frightening because there were murders in there? Or do, can we just see it by the widening eyes of the person who's about to, you know, knock on the door? These are questions we always want to ask ourselves. And my answer to those questions are the narrator comes in to explain things in order to create the pace and anticipation for the next action. That's my answer. We use the narrator for the music of the piece, basically, oh. and, to, and to raise the stakes and to help the reader. When we say... When we say he said and she said, that's the narrator. So the narrator does exist. But are they going to exist to the point that they call attention from us and diminish the experience that we could be getting through the characters? Let's face it, writing a narrator is easy peasy. It's so easy. It's so easy to tell everything. It's the easiest thing and there's no risk involved. So... We just really have to be careful and, and check ourselves with the various ways we justify using a narrator, shall we say. <laughs> and uh, we keep our eyes on the story itself rather than on our desire to tell people what the story is. And I actually, in this regard, I just wanted to bring up... Um, Right, so Sachi has forgotten, so we're switching points of view, and I and I have that. There's an, a couple places, um, so I'm I'm noting these verbs. So a good rule for us is to think about active verbs, right? So active transitive verbs. If we're using active verbs, then we have to have characters basically doing those verbs, rather than these uh, states of being. Um, you know, each of the divas had, here's were again. So it's really, really, we could say it's a verb issue. Um, I want to see, oh, okay. So I just wanted to draw your attention to this. So I was, so when you start the paragraph, <clears throat> I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I always essentially want to, I want to establish and continuously reestablish the point of view all the time as I'm writing. So at the beginning of a paragraph, I would have Indra, right? But what happens is you do want to describe that outside world. So just as I have Indra walk in, right? And he, he, and he looks out the window at the passing cosmos, right? And then walks over and leans against the Queen Anne's desk. Turning, he says, do you hear that, dear? Oh, I think, oh, it's the call to battle again, is it? It's like, I think it is. <laughs> I love that relationship between the two of them. See, like the relationships pop out, right? So in the same way that I would write that paragraph in that way, I would do it here too. Indra looked at his wife. She bit her lip, right? So it's, it's like I'm taking, I'm starting from him I'm seeing, and then I'm saying what he's seeing. So that's all actually still in his point of view, even though I'm writing sentences about other things. 
And I want to modulate that basically back and forth. So I actually take, I take really good care of it. I would have, he looked over, <clears throat> he saw her uh, biting, biting her lip. Uh, it was plum colored. Um, it, you know, it, it was unusual. Where did you get that, that color on your lips? Oh, I got that eons ago. And da, 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 da. It's like, well, it's distracting me. There's the battle that I can hear and I must go. And she's like, the battle now? <laughs> you know, he turned away, right? So now if I have a paragraph, I kind of enter into the paragraph. I deal with this issue. She has the, she has the, the, the lip color, you know, and then I, then I come out of the paragraph back with Indra, right? He turns away. It's like, when they call, I must go. Oh, do you? Right now? you know, whatever. Um, so that's a little bit of the way that we want to use point of view, but it's still essentially centered with, with, the, with our point of view character. And our point of view character is the protagonist. And our protagonist is the one who's going to basically struggle through their actions and arrive at a place of change. And it does occur to me, like, um, as you were reading, that maybe Indra's issue, in a way, is that he's a god and perceives himself as a god, and he's sort of jealous of this, that, you know, human beings can, you know, in, engage in this kind of development, where they can arrive and go through life, and then end up going someplace and arriving at a place of enlightenment, and it's as if that's been taken from him, right? He's not allowed to do that. He's just all-knowing. And, and anyway, it's a, it's a tricky proposition because basically you're going to take him through an experience, right? In which change is going to be possible. So I think it's really, uh, really neat. And, that, and in a sense, that is his enlightenment. His enlightenment is that being a God doesn't mean that you, you know, whatever, you know, you'll, you'll take it where you will. But um, I think it's a really, really neat story. But do try... <clears throat> I hope that makes sense. Like right now you are definitely just, you know, exploring through the plot, but do try and focus that point of view because that will make that character come out too. Uh -huh. And that's, that's, that's probably the thing that I employ the most actually to discover characters is concentrating on their action and point of view is actually an action, right? They're perceiving the world. So what they perceive and if you want to be a really crafty writer, what they perceive and including what they don't perceive. Right. That's getting to, that's getting to another level. That's understanding that we're in a point of view, but one of the aspects of point of view is that it is subjective. So it's a very, it's a very high level skill to be able to show through point of view, both the subjective experience and an objective experience that the character does not recognize. Um, you know, it might be, you know, you know, in the, 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 that, that little scene where, you know, she's biting her lip and the color and all of that, it's like, it's distracting me. And honey, why, is, why does your hand shake? Oh, no reason. Well, I must go when I hear the music. So why does your hand shake? No reason. It's like it shakes because she's frightened for him, right? He doesn't recognize that, but the reader does. So to understand that we're getting this subjective point of view, but then the reader understands that it's the subjective point of view, that's really uh, very engaging for the reader. Um, if you don't have any questions, I have some notes that <clears throat> kind of summing up that maybe we can go through for a second that maybe make a couple things clear. Do you, should we try it? Oh. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So this is what I wanted to kind of bring up to start with. I was thinking about this in regard to Ram's story and also Aditi, your story, but you know, all of these pieces that we basically start a story, we have a beginning of a story. 
what happens in the beginning of the story is this period behind the backstory, it is not part of the story. The character is just going along and they're just doing their thing. The story begins when essentially the protagonist and the antagonist become manifest because the protagonist recognizes a force that's preventing them from getting what they want. They've gone the rest of their life just basically going along, go, go with the flow, right? But here they've met an obstacle. When they meet that obstacle, they become, they exist. Does that make sense? They become a thing. They understand themselves as they understand I'm me and there's an obstacle, the antagonistic force. The antagonistic, and they recognize it because the antagonistic force doesn't simply give them, allow them to do whatever they want. They're prevented. So this, I, I'm sort of trying to write, this is the beginning. It's basically the protagonist is moving along like this. And the antagonist arrives. This is the start of the story. And this is the conflict that starts it. So <clears throat> the moment that that occurs, that, is, that can be considered the frame of the story. That frames the story. It is framed at the moment that the protagonist and the antagonist understand that each other exists, or rather that the protagonist understands that the antagonistic force exists. Does that make sense a little bit? Um, the frame is also the location. So I guess I include that to, to encourage you to keep thinking about this, the setting that you're placing this in. Once we put these two things together, they are someplace. The frame outlines where they are. If you want to think about it in abstract terms, the thesis does the same thing. Some people believe that Madonna is the greatest musician that ever lived. Other people don't. That frames the conversation. That frame is the location that we're discussing. The presence of the protagonistic force and the antagonistic force also frames and locates us in space and time, if you will. So when the protagonist understands that the antagonistic force exists, it basically comes into being. Does this make a little sense? So the sense of self or ego or I exist is realized at the moment in which they achieve some antagonism. <clears throat> this is the beginning, the essential conflict. And then what starts the story basically is that the protagonist decides that they're going to do something, they're going to act in order to get what they want. And so I call this the commitment. I will act to get what I want, which is to preserve this existence that I am, if that sounds a little bit circular. So they, they begin to do things. And that is basically the beginning of the story. So, you know, we might be able to look at this. And I mean, if we apply it to Ram's story, and Ram, you can chime in. You know, I don't think that we really, we don't see this because we don't have that point of view character. Aditi, in your piece, maybe we don't, we don't have this because we don't have a sense of Indra becoming something. It's as if Indra has always existed and just continues to exist. Now we've just begun the story. But this idea of becoming because of the conflict is not quite there. They don't become materialized. And that, may, that might be a way to think of it, right? The protagonist before this is not really materialized. In fact, the, the protagonist does not exist before the story begins, right? They're just simply going along. They're, they're immaterial. But at the moment of conflict, they exist. They are. And then they are manifest through their actions. The middle is, the way I term it, is the duration of struggle. There's a kind of complicated thing in terms of the middle that, that I'm not going to talk about right now. But basically, the middle, the, the, the 
actual center is sort of this turn in the in the movement of the story that has this kind of chiasmus look. It's that little point where the spiritual journey becomes dominant and the material journey becomes subservient. So that's a particular point. But basically the middle is the duration of struggle in which the protagonist acts against the antagonist and they lose. The protagonist acts against the antagonist again. They lose. The protagonist acts against the antagonist again. They lose again. Each time they lose is a cumulative effect. This is the sense of going down. In another way of thinking, there is no going down, right? I mean, we could say they act and they lose, they act and they lose, they act and they lose. But because it's cumulative, we feel it becoming more desperate. They can't do anything that allows them to win. Those are essentially the plot points of the middle. The duration of struggle is a collection of plot points of the protagonist acting against the antagonist and losing. Boom, boom, boom. And we can think of those as scenes. We can think of them as chapters, whatever we want. But we want them to obviously happen. And they basically, like I say, they have this cumulative effect that creates a sensation of them going down. So I, I was, <laughs> this is me early in the morning, and you have to forgive me. So I did this before we met. And I'm like, da 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 da. You know, my I've trained myself. My brain is like way too active, you know, when I wake up because this is my traditional writing time. And so if I'm not writing, then it goes in other directions, and you just have to forgive me. I'm so sorry. It seemed to me as I'm looking at this, that what the character doesn't realize, the unstable ground position, is that they don't realize that action is existence. They believe that existing is a static quality that they can achieve somehow independent of action, right? Because that's the thing that happens in the beginning. The thing that happens in the beginning is they come to this point where they're like, I exist, and they understand that they exist because of the opposition. What they want to do is continue to exist, though it feels like the opposition is stopping them from existing. They act against it. So the character doesn't realize that action is existence. Existence is not static. It's this active quality. And then, I just know the ending is the realization that through action, um, it's, sorry, ending is realization, epiphany, however you want to think of it, that through action, that is realization through action or actualization through action, which is also a choice of some kind. So that the character actualizes themselves through their action and their choice at the end of the story. Anyway, that's where I ended up taking it. But where I started was I wanted to sort of make clear this idea of trying to understand what, how conflict basically starts this story and how it makes the protagonist sort of have a sense of realization of self that wants something in relationship to the world around it and that they act to get it. And so from that, Aditi, for your piece anyway, it's in, in form there. Indra must be the person who's acting. Our protagonist and point of view character should be the person who's acting in regard to these forces of antagonism. And through that, they move towards this idea of discovery, self-discovery. I don't know if that made sense. I, it, it was actually better in my head earlier this morning. So apologies. I hope it's maybe a little bit helpful, but now I almost don't even understand how it is helpful. I, I, I thought it was helpful. I, I did have a question. So when you say the thesis as part of the setting, oh, I, I was that, thinking I, about it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I just include that there because I often like to, I, like I, so a thesis driven abstract argument is also a story in this regard. Like the story structure also applies to abstract argument as well from my point of view. They're both stories that basically pit things against each other and frame a conversation. 
We either do it with characters, which we do when we dramatize a story, or we can do it with a thesis statement where we're basically putting together two abstract events. I just wanted to include it just for kind of just for fun. And but, I guess my question was, is, is that thesis, um, because we usually have like a character who wants something that we know is not what they need. So the character has like a thesis in, in his or her mind. And then like the, the narrator or the author has like a, a thesis, which is like the, the premise because the author or narrator kind of knows or imagines that what the character wants isn't what they, what they need. So like that's another thesis. And so is it, I guess it's both or it's, it's, it's like the, or it should be the character driven, like the character's thesis and how they think the world is, that's, that's the thesis and then you're, showing how that just keeps getting tested and then you have the character arc is is that how to think of it i well so so the the character feels like they want something and what the what the writer understands is that what the character needs is to undergo the process of the story so that's finally what they need we don't know what the answer is going to be to that but we know that they need to undergo this process that is going to end up with some kind of actualization of self, basically. Um, I think the thesis thing was maybe complicating it a little bit. I think of a thesis is still a conflict. You know, um, many people think that uh, Madonna is the best musician that's ever lived. She isn't. So it's basically two points of view. And they come together a little bit. And as we develop a, an argument, we basically put the we pit the two sides of that argument against each other over and over again until we come to some kind of solution. And generally in arguments that are worth having come to some kind of merger between the two. While she's an excellent musician, it would be very hard to say that she's the best, right? Or whatever, you know, and so we come to some kind of compromise. And that, that I guess I'm sort of arguing that the, the, the abstract arguments that we've come to sort of discuss are actually arriving from this more um, material uh, sense of antagonism of protagonist and antagonistic forces. So the story form came first and oh. then our abstract thesis related arguments came second, but they follow the same format basically. So yeah, I guess that's what I'm saying. At first we had stories right? We had uh, me, you know, wanting to get that carrion over there, but it's being guarded by lions, you know, it was like, okay, I get it. I can't just get the carrion over there and eat it and, you know, bring it to my family. I have the lions to contend with. So I'm going to pick up this rock and throw it at the lion, <laughs> right? So, this is, you know, I'm the protagonist and the lines end up being that antagonistic force that I act against. Or if it's a thesis related argument, I'm proposing that Madonna is not the best. You think that she is. I'm going to try and tell you that other people are equally as good. I'm throwing a rock at all those people. I'm sorry, Aditi. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, it's really helpful because I, I think also because I'm a, I'm a lawyer, so I tend to do that abstract and I have an argument I want to make. And then, and then what happens if you put that before the story, it becomes like propaganda, like you were saying last time, where it's more agenda driven than story coming out of character and, and, and action. So it's, it's, it's helpful for me to think of it that way. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to think of, I think it's, I think it's helpful to think of them as basically being the same because, you know, also as a lawyer, right, if you made an argument in which you did not try to understand your opponent's point of view, you would be surprised when you walked into court, right? Right. So, and in fact, and if you're presenting something that was an argument, you would probably go through it by writing it all out. You might not present their side because let's say they fail to present their side but you would want to know everything that it could possibly present. And so you would write it out. This is my point. This is what their point is going to be. This is my point. This is what their point is going to be. You want to cover both sides right. in the same way. And you, and you want to definitely treat them. It's not ending up in court because the argument can't be made that there's one side that's more powerful than the other. And it's clearly right. 
it ends up in court because it's not clear who's right. So right. you have to you have to understand the quality of the two arguments and you have to present them both equally. You don't want to have a straw man, right? That's I mean, that's the yeah. equivalent for me. Like when someone writes, the protagonist is a great, noble, and true hero, and the antagonist is a is completely evil. Well, then the antagonist is basically a straw man. Of course, the you know the good person and the more powerful person overcomes them. You're just putting a straw man out there, but that's right. not something that's really going to engage, and it's not something that's going to finally win an argument either. Um, any questions about anything? I. Um, I, I wanted to just, uh, you know, just talking about this, uh, this David Mehmet's uh, sexual perversity in Chicago. I, I if you've read it, I'll uh, ask the question. Otherwise, it's. Uh... I, I'm, <laughs> I'm intrigued by the title, certainly, but um, no, I, I don't think I know it offhand. Did the. Um... The Mammoth, I've only seen, I mean, I've seen a couple of the movies. So mm -hmm. maybe, but maybe you can get us up to speed. Go ahead anyway. Okay, so so here we have uh, two people who get together and then they separate. And it's just, it's just, they're just two people who are in, not even in, incompatible, but they just, it's just how it is. They can't live together, you know, because they have that burden of being told that, a man is like this or a woman is like this, you know? So, but then we still don't know where, you know, what is the thesis that the author has started with and what is the antithesis in it? Uh, at least I couldn't figure it out, but but the dialogue was so good. I mean, even that you just glued to it, you want to read it in one go, I mean, come what may. So. Yeah. Well, well Mamet Mam is great at that, but, but uh, you know, I don't want. I don't want to. I, I don't want to take our stories and start thinking of them as theses necessarily. But there probably is a thesis behind it. Is love possible in in modern times? You know, is 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 true connection possible when we're also described to ourselves about what we should be? You know, like there's some there's something probably abstractly that's being looked at. But what I'm. But when we dramatize things we are creating sort of these material concrete characters that are engaging with each other that are showing basically the, I, want to, I was going to say the, the primordial story, which is simply conflict itself. There are two things at odds. And one of those things that, are, as, that is at odds is the perception of self itself, which, be, which becomes, manif I guess I'm arguing, becomes manifest when we meet our adversarial force. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and this is life, in fact. And then we act against it. We do things and we get responses from that adversarial force and we move on this journey. And that is a representation in, in, the, in the largest sense, in the most uh, general sense of what life is. We we'll choose our specifics in terms of what we're going to create as the protagonist, this character, Indra, a cup of coffee, the perception that Madonna is the best uh, musical artist ever in all time. You know, we're going to, we're going to create this perception of this and frame it with those that oppose that. Right. You know, um, so is it essential to know the premise of your work before you start or will it, I mean, if, if you look at Laos Agri, he says, premise is the first thing. Don't you dare write a story unless, until you know the premise. What, what, what yeah. does he mean by premise? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm asking. What does he mean by premise? He, like, wrote <laughs> in, the premise is uh, love wins over hatred, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, so is... Uh, so, so, so for me, so I wouldn't, that's not, that's not how I do it. What I want to do is like, I have actually no interest in making arguments. So I'm not, I'm not really that interested in that, but I am interested in seeing how things play out. I'm interested in putting characters on the page and framing them in a conflict basically, and trying to understand 
the nature of the human experience by putting characters through their paces in these ways, basically testing character. Okay. Right, right. So, so I'm, I mean, I, I'm really engaged in writing for the purpose of my own discovery as best as I can. And I want to discover something about real human beings, not my machinations of human beings. So I want to try and understand those human beings who are engaged in these issues as deeply as I possibly can and try and understand, basically in the end, understand their actions. Right. I, am, <clears throat> I am not trying to deal with thoughts or ideas whatsoever because I think that those are, well, I think that they, I don't think they represent truth. You know, like as you described that premise right, right there, it's like, that, that seems like a complete fabrication to me. I don't know what I think. I don't know whether love can survive in modern times or not. How, how would I know? Yeah. I, mean, I, I have no idea. So if I, if, 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 I, if I were to present that, it's like, that's just what I think. And what I think will then get in the way of me discovering what is true. And I'm only interested in discovering what is true and trying to represent that. I'm trying to witness. Okay. I'm right. trying, I guess I, I like, I, 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 I'm, I'm starting to think about this more and more like this. I'm trying to witness, I'm not trying to make. Right, okay. Right. And then, like I say, at the, at the end of the day, the story itself as I present it to someone is really just an archive of my experience doing that, right? It's a, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's, it's archeological evidence in the sense that I underwent this process. Right, right, right. Okay, yes, that, that's very uh, insightful. And liberating because I was racking my brain with the premise and not starting out the work. So now that I use the permission to go ahead and you know not worry about the premise and just get on. Yeah, I, I you know what, for me a really a big transition um, in in the way I thought about engaging in my writing was was when I realized that I had nothing to say. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's not that I didn't have things to say. I thought I had things to say and I thought I wanted to say a whole bunch of things. But when I realized it's like, who am I to say anything? I mean, honestly, who am I to say anything about what's tr true or right or, you know, and put that out into the world? That's ridiculous. It's only my point of view. And instead I started seeing the story as something that we construct, right? To bring forces together and to see what will come out. We are, we are not, we're not writing the work so much as witnessing the thing that we're constructing. And then we're, we're putting that witness on the page. That's it. Right. And, then, and then the audience can take from it what they will. I mean, ideally you create the same situation for the audience where they then witness what you've put on the page. And then they're gonna, they're, if they take away an idea, I don't know. I don't know if I even want that. <laughs> um, because that's a diminishment of life. You know, the idea, our idea is a diminishment of life. Right. right. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for all this great work this week. I really appreciate it. Um, it was uh, fabulous and, and wonderful to read and talk about. Thank you so much, Otis, and thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a marathon to our session, so thank you for <laughs> tuning in. And uh, we'll put this uh, up on YouTube, hopefully uh, in a couple of days. So the previous one took almost a week to get up uh, on YouTube. So uh, once it is up, I'll share the link. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you.